Last week, I asked you to send in your most antagonistic viewer questions. And I gotta say, y'all are way too nice. This is the worst that I got. How dare you? Yo, man, why haven't you mentioned awesome Yankee units? The first and second U.S. sharpshooters led by Hiram Burdan could kick the Stonewall Brigade's ass. Yeah, I don't know about that, but it's, it's possible. Uh, I should know one of my ancestors fought with that unit. It's funny that you should say that, because uh, when I worked at Gettysburg as a living historian, actually one of the characters I portrayed was one of Berdan's sharpshooters. Uh, I'll put a picture up here if I can, you know, find one, dredge it up on my computer. Yeah, I mean, it's, it is an incredibly badass unit, for sure. Uh, very much ahead of their time in a lot of ways, you know, targeting uh, uh, officers and stuff, which, I mean, you know, that wasn't sort of that ahead of its time. But, you know, they had the newest bits and bobs and gizmos. Burdan himself was an inventor. Uh, the selection process was extremely rigorous for those uh, regiments. They had to hit a target in order to just be considered for this unit. They had to be, hit a target that was 10 inches wide at 200 yards with muzzle loaders. Pretty incredible. Uh, and of course, you know, who could forget the nice uh, crisp green uniform. It's nice and camouflaging. I guess I haven't uh, talked about a lot of Yankee units because, uh, I mean, I don't know if you guys have noticed, but I don't really talk about the Union much when I do videos about the Civil War. For the simple reason that I'm way less interested in the Union than I am in the Confederacy. I'm just fascinated by the Confederacy. Uh, but, you know, hey, there's room for that. Who knows, that might come down the line. Your view on the whole witchcraft phenomena seeing as our modern outlook views it as stupid hysteria. Uh, hysteria, yes. Stupid, I, mean, I don't know, I don't know. I think um, that's kind of predicated on the idea that uh, people in the past were stupid. I don't know, it's probably not exactly what you meant, but I mean, that is a very common misconception. Uh, people in the past were just as smart as we are today. Um, and, you know, going way, way freaking back, you know, 70,000 years ago. Go back, you find a, uh, an early Homo sapien, they're just gonna, they're gonna be just as smart as you are. As far as witchcraft goes, you know, there's no question that it was incredibly destructive, deadly, hateful. I mean, a, uh, you know, thousands upon thousands of people, you know, innocent people, killed, executed, uh, because of, yes, as you say, hysteria. Uh, you know, a huge crime against humanity without a freaking doubt. But I think it is, kind of understandable why people believed in witches. It's important to understand that in the early modern era, the question of whether there was a supernatural world influencing our own was not even a question. Uh, people disagreed about the extent that witchcraft was dangerous. Uh, some people thought it was a, a huge threat that had to be dealt with harshly. Other people thought that the whole thing was a bit overblown, but nobody doubted the, the supernatural elements. Actually, I've been reading uh, kind of obsessively over and over uh, this one book, which is somewhere over here. Uh, Jesus Christ. Somewhere off camera. Here it is. Yeah, this book. It's uh, uh, Demonology by King James I. Here we go, he wrote it in 1597. So King James was a big believer in witchcraft. Uh, he thought it was a big, big problem. And um, this is a dialectic text. It's sort of framed as a dialogue between these two characters, one of whom is very clearly uh, James himself. Um, and, uh, you know, and one of them is more skeptical about witchcraft, and the other one, sort of the stand-in for King James, is, you know, super knowledgeable and, you know, uh, has all the, you know, pithy comebacks and stuff like that. Um, uh, you know, it's very, very much like, you know, 16th century uh, checkmate Lincolnites. He sees it as a big problem that there are princes in the courts of Europe who allow magicians to perform little magic tricks uh, for the amusement of the court. and as far as James or anybody else is concerned at that time, these magicians did have magical powers. And James traces those magical powers to the devil. So he's basically saying, you know, you go to, into any court in Europe, on the, on the continent especially, 
and uh, you can find these magicians who are in league with the devil. Uh, now he sort of points out that a lot of these magicians are kind of unknowingly uh, in league with the devil. Basically, they thirst for knowledge, you know, and, and the Adam and Eve parallels are, are very apparent. You know, they sort of, they thirst for, for knowledge of the natural world, you know, so kind of like sort of talking about science or very, very early type of uh, uh, science. They, uh, so in their quest for knowledge about the natural world, they learn these powers, which unbeknownst to them have been revealed to them deliberately by Satan. So yeah, you just gotta sort of put yourself into this world and imagine what it would be like to, you know, live in uh, a magical fantasy realm. I mean, honestly, you know, the way that people in the early modern era saw, and before, uh, saw their the world around them was very much in the way that, you know, Frodo sees Middle Earth or, you know, Geralt of Rivia sees, you know, whatever, the continent or whatever that, that universe is, you know, where magic is real and it's all around you. And, you know, you, you ride into a town and they say, we've got a Kikimora problem or whatever, you know, and it's like, okay, and you take that very seriously. And actually, demonology is a huge influence on the Sudbury Devil, my upcoming feature film about 17th century witch finders. Thank you, by the way, everybody who has uh, contributed so far to our crowdfunding campaign. Your support so far has been amazing. But as Benny told Burns after Emotep had taken his eyes and his tongue, I'm afraid more is needed. We still have three more weeks left in the campaign. If you've been meaning to contribute and you haven't already, uh, please do so. The link's down below. All right, shameless self-promotion over. Let's get back to the questions. What do you think of secession morally? Ooh, ooh, good question. Of course, the CSA was a slave oligarchy, but if a state or even a territory tried to secede today, do you think the rest of the union would be right to oppose it? All right, well, I knew this day would come. I'm about to alienate half of my subscribers. Let's go. I don't think that there is anything inherently immoral about secession. I think that there's something inherently immoral about slavery, uh, but when it comes to seceding from the Union, you enter this kind of, you enter kind of the intersection between morality and legality. Um, I personally do not base my, my, my morals and my principles on what is legal and what is not. Now, you know, just to be clear, boys, I'm not like a criminal or anything, you know, I'm not uh, uh, cooking up meth in my basement. I mean, I don't have a basement, I live in Louisiana, but still. There is such a thing as an unjust law, uh, and as an in individualistic, you know, freedom-loving American, I'm not just gonna, you know, do whatever the powers that be tell me to do, uh, in a lot of cases. So, secession wasn't even technically illegal or, you know, deemed unconstitutional until 1869. Uh, certainly, there would have been some founding fathers that thought otherwise, you know, I mean, um, you know, John Adams, Alexander Hamilton, definitely Alexander Hamilton. I mean, you know, before the Civil War, as far as the legality of secession, it kind of depended on who you ask, but, uh, but it wasn't, you know, on the books uh, until after the Civil War, when the Supreme Court definitively said secession is unconstitutional. And of course, treason is a very nebulous term. Uh, treason is something, treason's whatever, the powers that be decide that it is. Uh, you may have noticed that I have, in all of my, you know, Confederate bashing that I've done on this channel, I have never once called them treasonous. Uh, you know, even though from the Northern perspective, they absolutely were. But you wouldn't call the Haitian revolutionaries traitors. You wouldn't call the Founding Fathers traitors, necessarily. Um, even though, you know, technically that is what they were. They were breaking the law, all that kind of stuff. Now, it's v a very slippery slope. Uh, and veers dangerously into lost cause territory when we compare the secession of the Confederacy to the uh, rebellion of the 13 colonies. I mean, that is, you know, classic neo-Confederate territory. Uh, but, <laughs> you know, I think there is, uh, when we're talking about this sort of philosophical moral idea, I feel like there there is a bit of an apt comparison, I dare say, in that, uh, you know, really whether or not it is considered a rebellion or an immoral secession or anything, I mean, that kind of depends on the outcome, right? Though I do think that secession, both then and potentially now, is spectacularly stupid. 
um, all that it did back then. I mean, you know, the Civil War, it was over an election. An election. An election of a man that they thought would take away their slaves. Is kind of the end of the day broad strokes of it. You know, just wait four years and vote them out. <laughs> you know? No need for 600,000 people to die like Jesus Christ. It was spectacularly stupid, and it would be today as well. If a state or a territory seceded from the Union today, which, you know, would not happen because it is unconstitutional and the federal government just would not allow it. But, um, uh, and yeah, what would happen if that happened today was that everybody's lives in those seceded states or territories would get immediately noticeably worse. Uh, you, you know, grocery store shelves would be empty, there'd be gas shortages, uh, there'd be water shortages, you know, there, there, there would just be a lot of uncertainty and a lot of chaos, and it would just be bad news. I suppose that something like that could conceivably happen, but if it did, then it would be sort of like indie ref with Scotland, right? Or, you know, Brexit with the UK leaving the EU. It would be, you know, a vote would be taken. And if, you know, a majority of people voted for secession, then that state or territory would secede. But again, I, I, I just don't see the federal government even allowing a vote like that to take place. Uh, I don't really think it's in the cards. Um, and uh, yeah, and even though I don't think there's anything inherently wrong with secession, uh, I do think it's just dumb. It's unadvisable. Hey now, it's your boy, Atun Shea Films. And when I'm out in the wilderness, debunking neo-Confederates wherever I find them, there's nothing I enjoy more than to stop, take a couple drags off my Maverick Lucky. Mm. Full of flavor and body. You know that feeling? When you've had your tenth drag. Feel like you could do anything. And that's what I'm feeling right now, brothers and sisters. And that's what I wish for you. Right now, there's a half off sale at philipmossusa.com. <laughs> Get your first 20 packs free. It's your boy, Artoon Shea, with a message from his sponsors. Mm. Would you rather have sex with the most ugliest, disgusting woman in the world who will give you a sexual disease, or have sex with the most handsome, sexiest man in the world, but everyone in the world will know? That's not even a fucking question, man. It's so easy. Of course I would have sex with the sexiest man in the world. And you say that everyone in the world would know? Like, that's a bad thing. Like, pfft. I would have such a reputation, man. I had sex with the sexiest, most handsome man in the world. Pfft. This is like not even a question. I don't want a sexual disease. Could you do a video on Nathan Bedford Forrest's civil rights activism? In Tennessee, after the Civil War, I read about it, but I'm not sure if this is made up or actually a real thing. Uh, I have not heard anything about this, but I am about 99.999% sure that that is made up. Uh, I doubt that Nathan Bedford Forrest had much time for civil rights activism after the Civil War because he was very busy founding the Ku Klux Klan. Our gallant confederate mentioned Judah Benjamin last time. I, su I assume you mean the uh, Checkmate Lincolnites episode. How then could the Confederacy have been racist with all the Jews that lived and served there? Um, <laughs> uh, that is, that, that I, I know this is, you know, tongue in cheek, but uh, yeah, that's pretty common, you know, lost cause, uh, little sort of talking point. Um, Judah P. Benjamin, a very, very prominent Jewish Confederate. And in fact, Confederacy was much more accepting of uh, Jewish people than the, the North at the time was. Um, but that kind of also brings up an interesting little lost cause consistency. Because the, you know, <laughs> they'll either tell you 
the Confederacy couldn't have been racist because look how progressive they were about the Jews. Or they'll say the North was run by Jews and uh, it's part of the Jewish conspiracy to take over the world. Um, you know, so which fucking is it, man? There we go, another Civil War question. Oh, Jesus. Your gods and generals' thoughts are well documented. They are, they are well documented. Gettysburg, by contrast, is often praised for being historically accurate and relatively even-handed to both sides. If a film about the Civil War were made today, in 2020, which event slash person should be portrayed, and how could it be produced in a way that wouldn't be deemed as propaganda by either side? What could be the modern Gettysburg to bridge films like Gods and Generals and Glory? Let's make one thing absolutely freaking clear here, though. Uh, Glory is a film with a bias but it is in no way as biased as Gods and Generals. Let's be 100% clear about that. Um, Glory is in the realm of reality. Gods and Generals is more fantastical than Lord of the Fucking Rings. Gettysburg is... is overrated, and it's aging. It's, it's, it's not a bad movie, like not by any stretch of the imagination. You know, I've seen it several times. I enjoy it. I especially enjoyed it when I was younger. Um, it is relatively even-handed to both sides. I would not call it historically accurate, though. You can get the regimental flags right. You can say, okay, this officer was at this point and did this on this exact time, and we're going to portray that. But, like, the problem with Ron Maxwell is that he has book learning but he has no humanity to his movies. There's just no, there's just nothing there. That movie could have been made by a patriotic robot. And also Maxwell just like echoes some common misconceptions about the battle. You know, the biggest one that I can think of right now is the overemphasis of uh, Colonel Joshua Chamberlain's role in the defense of the uh, 20th Maine. Um, the credit that goes to Chamberlain really belongs to Strong Vincent, but, uh, Vincent died that day. He died on July the 2nd, 1863. Chamberlain survived. Chamberlain was a political soldier who knew how to market himself. And that's why we see him as this great hero. Um, you know, he, he served his country. He did it admirably. He was very brave. He fought well. But he is not, you know, it was not because of the 20th Maine that the Union won the Battle of Gettysburg. That is a gross oversimplification, and it's buying into Chamberlain's uh, self-aggrandizement. But to go back to your question here, um, <laughs> uh, if a Civil War movie were made today, what should it be? I mean, dude, I would love to make a Civil War movie. Uh, and I think it would almost certainly have to be about or at least focus, for the most part, on common soldiers and speak to more the experience of war rather than the politics of the 1860s. Once you dip your toes into the politics of the 1860s, then you are asking for trouble. I would love to see Gettysburg remade into like a miniseries or something, you know, a five episode miniseries on something on, you know, a, a prestige television network where they could, you know, have blood and guts and stuff and swearing and really make it gnarly and gritty. I'd love for there to be a whole subplot about, you know, Dan Sickles. Uh, <laughs> that would be great. Uh, you know, there's a, a pivotal part of the battle happened on Culp's Hill that wasn't even in the movie Gettysburg. Um, you know, you could talk about Burdan's sharpshooters, you know, you could show them, you could show uh, the Iron Brigade, I mean, my God, the Iron Brigade, you know, that, that intense fighting on the first day, which is often kind of like underplayed, it's sort of seen as the, the prelude to the, to the carnage of the second and the third day of those battles, but, or of that battle, but, um, no, I mean, you know, that first day was incredibly fucking brutal, um, and, you know, you could do that justice, uh, that, uh, whatever that Minnesota regiments, uh, it was like the second or third Minnesota or something like that, that, uh, defended Cemetery Ridge, on the second day and basically allowed the, you know, and 90% and of them were either, you know, killed or wounded. And their heroic defense allowed the Union to entrench on Cemetery Ridge, which of course in the third day allowed them to crush um, uh, Longstreet slash Pickett's charge. There's a lot that you could do with that. You could also sort of portray the uh, diversity of the Union Army, that's never really been done. The fact that many, you know, a large percentage was made up of immigrants, and you could have Union soldiers speaking in German and Swedish and all these sorts of languages, uh, rather than just do the gods and generals thing. And it's just like, oh, it's the Irish, it's the Irish are fighting for freedom, it's the Confederacy they should be fighting for, you know. Um, 
that fucking shit, you know. I've had a dumbness with our Irish brothers. They've been led to their fates. No, 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 are you interested in German history and do you want to make videos about it? Um, I, I, I wouldn't say I'm particularly interested in German history. Uh, if you yourself are German, Mr. Rudy902, then you'll probably roll your eyes at what I'm about to say next. But the most fascinating part of German history for me is, I'm sorry, but it's it's Nazi Germany. Um, I've, I've got that Nazi uniform in my closet. <laughs> oh boy. Which, you know, is definitely gonna make some more appearances on this channel for sure. Uh, you know, just gotta find some good concepts for it. I don't, I don't just want to whip out the Nazi uniform for shock value. Uh, I think that it's if you're gonna appear on screen in an SS uniform, that's that's a powerful thing, right? That's a powerful image. That's an evocative image, um, and I think it would be wrong to use that power irresponsibly to use it for. Uh, um, shock value or just for cheap laughs or whatever. We got some chain mail, you know, some severed limbs and stuff and oh shit. Oh, don't look at that one. Don't look at that one. Don't look at that one. I am going to make more sort of Nazi Germany videos, but uh, I want them to be A, educational and B, uh, and you know, just have educational value. That's just really important to me. Um, and, and B, have, um, you know, I want the satire to be just very clear. I, I I don't want there to be any question in any view, any reasonable viewer's mind that I am trying to deplore this ideology. Being a resident of Louisiana and New Orleans, what are your thoughts about Sam the Banana Man Murray? I mean, it's a fascinating story. Really interesting guy. Uh, you know, born into poverty, you know, poor Jewish guy who kind of rose through the ranks in his business to eventually become such a powerful mogul that he was able to depose the governments of Latin American countries. Like, it's an incredible story. I, I, I really should make a video about him. I really should. Uh, uh. Okay, one more question, and then my sister-in-law is coming by with some with, with some dogs that I gotta look after overnight, so. What are your political beliefs? Vermin Supreme 2020, baby. Uh, no, I, <laughs> I'm not gonna give you a straight answer on this. Uh, it doesn't mean that you're a bad person for asking it. It's not like you're a Democrat or anything. There's a couple reasons that I don't wanna talk about this. The first is, that I'm not qualified to talk about it. I have no desire to share these opinions on a public forum because I look like an idiot. Um, I, there are some topics like, you know, history, storytelling, film that I have a formal training in or that I have been employed in those fields. People have paid me money to talk about those things um, that I do feel qualified about and, you know, Certainly, as you guys probably know, you know, sometimes that is sort of intersected with some political ideas, and I've been not shy about sort of uh, giving my opinions about those, but those were informed opinions. The second reason is that if I come out and say, I'm this thing, I'm voting for this person, then there's a pretty good chance that I could alienate some of my audience. And one of the things that I really like about this little community that we've built here is that, um, it's pretty diverse. Um, as far as I can tell, there's a lot of people of all sorts of different beliefs and backgrounds and, um, you know, ethnicities and whatever, in nationalities. Granted, most of you are men, but that's kind of to be expected for a history tube thing. You know, let's face it, a history tube is a bit of a sausage fest. But, uh, you know, apart from that, y'all are pretty diverse and we all get along and it's great. I don't want to become one of those YouTubers who just kind of like, tolerates their audience, you know, or that their audience is like very obviously of a particular political persuasion or a particular demographic or whatever. Now, there's a very good chance that when and if this channel gets bigger that, you know, we'll kind of lose that little sort of special, um, you know, wholesomeness that we do have now. Um, but uh, if that does happen, then I'm going to fucking fight against it and I'm going to let people know. The only folks that I really have no patience for and who are not welcome here at Atunche Films Incorporated Limited uh, are racists, misogynists, homophobes, um, 
extremists. You know, every other, pretty much everything short of that, I'm totally fine with. Left, right, center, whatever, I don't care. It's fine, as long as you're a reasonable person and not a complete fucking asshole. Uh, but you know, the moment you cross that line, the moment you start hating on people for something that they cannot help, then uh, I got no fucking patience for you. I'll block your ass, I'll delete your fucking comment. I don't fucking care, it's my channel. Fucking sue me, cocksuckers. Okie dokie, so uh, yeah, my sister-in-law is gonna be here any fucking second now and I don't want her dogs to like knock over all my lights and shit. So I think uh, we will call it a day. Thank you so much for sending in your questions. Really enjoy doing these videos. It's great to hear from you guys. Um, cheers. Ah. Bye.